Okay. Thank you so much, Sne. Good morning, UKZN students and staff. Welcome to the industry talk for semester two, hosted by the School of Engineering, specifically the discipline of electrical, electronic, and computer engineering. My name is Lena Rajpal, and I'm the public relations person for the College of Agriculture, Engineering, and Science. I want to thank you all for joining us today. Most importantly, I want to thank our guests from ESCOM who've taken time to present to all our students and staff. I would now like to just mention a few house rules for the program. Firstly, the event is recorded. In terms of complying with the Papia Act, kindly note that we will use the information from the event for publishing purposes. In terms of comply, sorry, should you not want your information to be published for the purposes stated above, kindly send me your concerns to rajpaul at ukzn.ac.za. During the course of the event, all attendees will be muted with their video switched off. If you have any questions during the presentations, kindly post them in the chat box facility where it will be answered. During the Q&A session, the presenter will give you a chance to ask your questions. Please raise your hand so that the tech person can allow you to unmute and pose your questions to the specific presenter. If by any chance attendees interfere with the presentations, please note we will um, acknowledge your details and remove you from the event. Finally, the recordings will, email, will be emailed to all attendees presented, uh, present and will also be posted on the CAES website. Without further time taken, I would now like to hand over to Dr. Muhammad Fayaz Khan, who is a senior lecturer in the discipline of electrical, electronic and computer engineering. Thank you, Lena. Good afternoon to all staff, students, and guests who are joining us today for our industry slash tech talk. So again, on behalf of the College of Agriculture, Engineering, and Science of UKZN, I'd like to welcome you all. Um, today, as was discussed, we're going to be addressed by ESCOM. And as I, as I had been an employee of ESCOM for over 20 years, I think it seemed fitting that uh, I chaired this uh, interaction with you students. ESCOM is probably one of the most recognizable brands in the country, um, so much so that even if you're not supplied by ESCOM, should your power go out at home, it's generally who you'll blame. Um, that comes with pros and cons, but I'm sure we'll get to that soon. However, it's also important as young graduates and professionals that we ensure that we see the truth for what it is sometimes, and that we're not advised by popular opinion. We don't need to depend on uh, WhatsApp messages or radio DJs to explain to us sometimes the technical merits and complications of running a power system or the impacts on the economy, for et cetera. It's always good to kind of understand things from its source and be more well-informed. The challenges, however, faced by ESCOM are very well known. But what we all have to embrace is that it's gonna take a very collective effort from uh, society, from industry, from professionals to kind of all set this right. It's a burden that all staff at ESCOM are very well aware of. We continuously are told and know that should ESCOM fail, uh, the country would fail. But engagements like what we're having today is what ensures that that day never comes. In my time at ESCOM, I've known uh, many different careers to be there. We've had uh, obviously the engineers, the electrical, electronic engineers, chemical, mechanical, and civil, but we find that we have graduates from throughout the college in terms of graduates from computer science, uh, environmental science, geology, uh, because ESCOM is that big an organization where the mix between generation, transmission, distribution, is it's quite vast. So with no further ado, I think how we also have uh, careers obviously from outside of the college and maybe some of those students are here today. So to get things started, I don't think you're here to hear me talk. I'm just going to uh, coordinate the event. I'd like to begin by introducing our first speaker, 
who's in Soaki Hatebe, who's a senior manager in learning, skills development, and transformation. And Soaki started her journey in ESCOM as a GIT, a graduate in training in July 2002 at Letabo Power Station. And in that time, she's managed to cover the entire HR value chain. She was appointed permanently as an HR officer in December 2002 and moved through different HR positions where she gained very good experience. She was appointed as HR manager at Letabo Power Station in January 2008 where she managed a broader portfolio of people management strategies in alignment with HR division mandates. In 2013, she was appointed as a middle manager in HR operations, managing HR within seven different power stations, Letabo, Matla, Creel, Matimba, Tuchuka, Majuba, and Duva. She was recently appointed in her new role, in which she'll be addressing us today, as senior manager in the skills and talent COE. She's also the proud mother of two boys, so I'm sure she wants to guide you, you our kids as well. So as I said, Nzoki was going to discuss uh, ESCOM skills development and options available to you. Nzoki, I'll hand over to you. Thank you very much, my colleague, and uh, good afternoon to um, the students as well as good afternoon to the staff uh, that is available for today. Allow me to thank you very much for this wonderful opportunity to come and address you um, and maybe also just share with you the good things that ESCOM is doing on the skills development fraternity. I think as people would normally say, and I think uh, you've said it very uh, well, Mohammed, that in a way uh, ESCOM is mainly known for its load shedding and people only focus mainly on you know, the impact of, of load shedding on their lives, but necessarily they do not take the time maybe to just look at what other um, good and, and, and well opportunities that are, are in existence in our business. So I'm looking forward to, ready to a very um, wonderful interaction for today. Um, I'll share with you and I'm asking that maybe we should reserve um, our questions towards the end uh, so that we can then allow the flow of the presentation and such. So I will be moving. Uh, if you can just confirm for me, Mohammed, if you can see my presentation and that it's moving smoothly on your side. I can confirm everything looks good. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. So colleagues, um, as I've said, ESCOM has been um, in the forefront of skills development for many, many years. And we have been seen at some point as um, one of the key role players in development of skills and capacity in South Africa. And by this, we have managed really to pride ourselves with uh, our ability to build a strong pipeline, not only to satisfy the ESCOM requirements in terms of our, our pipeline, but mainly also to ensure that we upskill and skill the South African um, uh, workforce of the future and of the current um, as we have it in, in the business. So as ESCOM, we actively participate in, in skills development um, initiatives with other major partners. We participate mainly within the governmental um, status where we work with different organizations to make sure that we, we can provide skills to our young ones. And, and this has seen an increase in access uh, of high quality education, as well as also doing a lot of training and development opportunities within the technical and non-technical uh, space. So what we do, we provide bursaries, which I think for UKZN mainly as students, you would really be uh, looking forward to understand uh, the bursary systems for ESCOM. We also do very well in apprentices, where we provide apprentices in different fields, which I will share with you uh, later as I progress with the slides. And we're also very, very high on learnerships as well. But what is also very keen, which I believe as students for today, you might even want to get interested on, and I'm hoping that the Workplace Integrated Learning Office for UKZN will also uh, take heed on this one. It's our program for work Workplace Integrated Learning, where we bring the graduates into our operations to come and give them exposure on the work that we do. And at the end of the day, these engineers and technicians, you find that they leave ESCOM with credible engineering skills for them to be able to go out there and, and start um, uh, their engineering careers in the different uh, sectors in South Africa. And we support a lot of the national development plan. You will know that ESCOM is a, um, a company that is wholly owned by the government. Therefore, we are um, 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 required to drive uh, the national priorities of our country in terms of 
skills development, and the majority of those are driven through the National Development Plan, as well as the National Skills Development Strategy 3, which basically just uh, um, tells us how we need to ensure um, um, you know, alleviation of poverty, creation of jobs, um, and so ensuring that our economy grows and that we have some economic growth in our transformation imperatives, but mainly to create a, a workforce that can be employable uh, in the future. So I'm moving now to the next slide. As I move to the next slide, I want to share with you um, some of what becomes very, very critical. Um, people would understand that in, in this day and age in South Africa, what you mainly want to see, you want to find that um, the young South Africans can go out there and find skills development programs that will at least align them with what is required in the current uh, South African job market. You will understand that with the current change and, and the drive into the, the fourth industrial revolution, you would have realized that in ESCOM as well, we are busy also uh, going through a just energy transition where we want to make sure that we can align our current uh, uh, markets with our future markets and ensure that the skills are available in South Africa to meet uh, those minimum requirements. So in awarding these programs, we extend these to our external candidates and this will mean that we go out of ESCOM and we look for South Africans who are not employed and we bring them into ESCOM through any of our programs for them to be, um, um, you know, um, at least have their skills broadened and for them to be able to um, enter into the national skills pool. So as ESCOM, if I were to tell you, maybe the money that we would spend on training on an annual basis, we spend in the margin of about 1.1 billion. And this is when we take a ratio, which is a percentage of about 3.75% uh, of our uh, headcount cost, and we turn it into training and development expenditure. So that is the money that we would have uh, invested in training to the value of 1.1 billion. You will know that the Skills Development Levies Act necessarily requires us to spend about 1% of our leviable amount. But what we do, we then take Take it further as ESCOM and we spend 3.75, which equals to uh, 1.1 billion of, of our headcount cost. As I move through to the, to the next slide, this slide basically just gives you a skills development integrated model in ESCOM. So it doesn't just only talk to skills development in terms of what the human resources department will be doing, but it gives you an opportunity to have an idea of what ESCOM also does in other businesses where you might also be interested in. So if you look at this part, if you can see my CASA, I hope it's visible, you would see that we are developing the skills for employability. And this is now where we take it from a primary school level, high school level, until we get to um, candidates like you at, at UKZN. So we will sponsor uh, children from a primary level, move them into a high school level, and um, award them a bursary to go and study um, in any of the institutions in South Africa. If UKZN becomes an, an institution of choice for them, then they can come to UKZN and do that. We also then do post-schooling also for TVET colleges, like I said, we are very big in apprentices as well as uh, leadership programs. Therefore, our Tibet colleges that are local to our operations will then be beneficiaries to this. We also then have what we call contract academy. So let's assume you qualify in UKZN and you decide you're going to open your own engineering company. You're not going to be working for anybody else, but you want to open your own uh, engineering company, which is what we are also um, encouraging because it will give you an opportunity to employ others other than having yourself to be employed and, and other people also start uh, looking out for employment. You can come through our uh, contractor academy. There we, we then give you some mentorship we incubate you and your business, and we ensure that you are able to then fend for yourself. We register you, we, we provide you with somebody that can walk the path with, with you as a mentor, and you are able to then leverage on our supplier networks and get that particular um, opportunity to rise as a business owner, and ultimately then register onto our supplier network and be able to come and be one of the, of the ESCOM providers or suppliers one day. On the bursary fraternity, like I said, we give bursaries for university students, we give bursaries for TVET college students, uh, for them to be able to go out and, and, and obtain their qualifications. All our bursaries are at an undergraduate level. 
at this point in time. But as ESCOM, we have another research and development program that then affords postgraduate research programs and they are able to therefore fund the programs and be able to work with the institutions. I am uh, aware of a project that we ran with UKZN where we were developing the, the Lions robot, which was then very big and ultimately that robot um, was one of the well sought out in Japan, uh, which was developed with the students and the capacity from the UKZN. So you can see that through those bursaries really, there are very big opportunities for you to also um, start in learning new skills and really just taking your skills way, way up. And by that really, we want to create employable people. If if you provide a bursary, ultimately we bring you into ESCOM, we provide you with our engineering and training program, our artisan in training program, our technician in training program, and other professions in the non-technical space as well. So that by the time you leave our programs, either you are employed in ESCOM, or you are employable outside of ESCOM. So we do not want to create a pool of pipeline of people that goes to the pavement. We want to create a pool of people who go out and become employable. Through Apologies, our it's okay. uh, uh, Thank you, my friend. So this slide Sorry, basically I, just covers it. It's okay. I just was going to say, I think if you can try and wrap up in three minutes, I know you we'll have a lot so. of information. Thank you. We'll do so. Thank you. So, so this part, I think I've spoken to, it's a part that necessarily just talks to if you want to really open a business of yourself and you need to be incubated, we can upskill you in that regard and provide you with that support. And this is basically for our permanent employees and what we do with our own permanent employees as well. The next slide literally just tells you the information that I would have spoken to. So at a university, basically we give these forms of bursaries who would support electrical engineers, electronic engineers, mechanical, industrial, civil, metallurgy, chemical and nuclear engineering as well. In the University of Technology, mainly we look at four areas, even though we support more than that, but we mainly focus on four, which is electrical, mechanical, electronic, as well as the, the drafts technicians, learnerships and apprenticeships, electricians, instrument mechanicians, fitters, fitters and tenors, as well as the plant operators, which is a big in our generation space as well. This is mainly our key ones that currently we are supporting in the UKZN space, where we have a fleet of some of our uh, bursars that are currently supported by ESCOM. They are in this key um, um, fields of studies. I just want to maybe just share with you um, the information with regard to what we, we do as well um, in KZN. But these are the other programs. The Workplace Integrated Program I spoke to, we can get hold of you through the Workplace Integrated uh, Learning Department in UKZN and help you to obtain uh, practical learning as required as a graduate uh, uh, within the UKZN space. So now, just to share with you uh, our footprint in UKZN, we are currently supporting 19 students, and I think this number, colleagues, we are not happy with. We want to strengthen our partnership in such a way that we can uh, support more than 19 students within the UKZN space. And if we look at uh, the money that we are spending, um, currently we are spending 2.3 million within the UKZN space. But if you look at in 2020, we were spending about 3.6 million there. So we are encouraging really that um, this program, hopefully it will encourage you to want to uh, at least apply for a bursary, either for your second, third or fourth year, because you are already in the program or join us on your uh, workplace integrated learning as one of the engineers in training within uh, our own operations. I will stop it there, Mahomet. Thank you very much for the time provided. Thank you, Nswaki. Uh, I just want to remind the students that the picture that Nswaki is sharing is not what we do at ESCOM. Huh? But uh, I think the presentation was very well received and very informative. There's lots of uh, questions for you on the chat, so maybe you can have a look at that and respond to some. And if you feel that maybe we'll address some of them in the Q&A session, that'll be fine. But moving on, guys, uh, I think what the keynote, if I could call it that talk for today, will be given by Professor Prithaban Mudli. Uh, Prithaban currently holds the position of Research Manager, Specialist Transmission and Distribution at the ESCOM Research uh, Testing and Development Business Unit. He has over 20 years of power utility experience in various roles within ESCOM. And Professor Mudli is a registered professional engineer and holds the following degrees, a bachelor's, a master's, and a PhD in electrical engineering from WITS. 
I know he's also now associated with the University of Johannesburg, so hopefully he doesn't try to take some of our students away. Uh, Professor Mudley is an active member of various national and international industry, bo industry bodies. And when I was asked who in ESCOM could deliver this talk to our students, he was the first name that came to my mind, the first person I contacted, and obviously responded uh, in the affirmative. So I'm very grateful to you, uh, Prof Mudley, for joining us today and for sharing this vision that you're going to share with the kids uh, and uh, the other guests today in terms of the direction that ESCOM is taking. I'll hand over to you. Thanks, thanks so much, uh, Dr. Khan. Uh, really uh, appreciate the invitation and uh, the opportunity to, to share some of the thoughts and kind of future of, of the energy utility uh, with uh, both the staff and students. And, you know, UKZN has been uh, a, a very important partner to ESCOM and in my area of work, uh, the research area of work, we've done many, many great things with UKZN and uh, we'd like to continue collaborating and continue, you know, um, supporting our students and, and bringing them into the, into, uh, the fold and, and contributing to the energy industry. Uh, I just want to check, you can see my, my slide and, and I'm coming through Audible. It all looks good on my side, Pratabhan. Okay, excellent. So I'm really going to start off this, this talk uh, with this picture. And this, this is quite an important day uh, in the history of, of uh, well, South Africa and, and in the history of, of electrical energy. Uh, this is a picture taken way back when, uh, you know, almost 100 years ago, just over 100 years ago, in a small town in Kimberley. Uh, and you can actually see some of the dates of, of this town. What's really interesting about this picture is not just the, the clock and, and uh, you know, the old buildings, but it's really this, this uh, street lamp here. And what's very interesting about the street lamp is that way back when, you know, over 100 years ago, um, this small town in Kimberley had electric street lights. Um, and it was so important for, for driving, you know, the, the mining activity in, in Kimberley the streetlights were actually installed before uh, places like London and most of Europe had electric streetlights. So, you know, as South Africans, we, we were very keen, very uh, important to, to embrace things like electrical uh, technologies. And we were at the forefront, you know, at the very onset when uh, I think about three, four, five years prior, Thomas Edison had actually invented the electric light bulb. Um, in terms of my, my outline, I'm just going to talk through some of these changes that's happening in the, the uh, electrical energy um, you know, industry. And there's a, a bunch of things that's happening and it's making this, this, uh, this area really exciting, very interesting, adopting new technologies. And you know, we're in this, this important process of uh, molding and shaping our industry for the future. So I'm going to talk through some of these things like net zero, carbon free and, and renewables. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about the supply demand balance and how do we manage supply and demand. And it's really important to understand that. What are these, these new technology options uh, in terms of you know, solar, wind, renewables, gas, nuclear and, and, and the like? Um, and what's the implications for our transmission and distribution business? And then we're going to talk a little bit about some of this new and interesting opportunities that come through on the demand side of, of this balance, which is uh, things like self-generation, things like electric vehicles, the demand response, and, and some of this energy efficiency, uh, you know, exciting opportunities. So really, at the, at the very beginning, uh, you know, everyone's talking about this change in this electric, uh, electrical uh, kind of industry and it's not this conversation is not just South African it is global uh, and a lot of it is talking about why do we change and how do we change so there are some scenarios around things like net zero and you'll hear that in the media and net zero is really about saying you know as we produce this electri electricity on the supply side of this balance we need to make sure that nothing actually you know, harmful stuff actually escapes into the environment and cause, uh, you know, uh, uh, environmental damage. Uh, and the idea here is that 
you can use a bunch of different types of generation technologies, things like uh, renewables, things like storage, hydrogen, nuclear. In fact, you can also use gas and, and coal as long as you capture all of the, you know, the um, in, uh, the polluting uh, co contributions from gas and coal, uh, and you don't let it escape into the environment. That's kind of net zero, and you know, a lot of countries have been putting targets by 2030, 2050. A lot of them have been talking about 2050 to get to this net zero, um, and and it talks to things like our Paris Agreement and COP agreements and so forth. Then there's the carbon-free scenarios, and no one really talks too much about this, but this is an important scenario. And this talks about, as we start changing this, this uh, generation mix of ours and uh, every other country, uh, can we use everything except things that produce carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases? Uh, and you have a bunch of, of uh, technologies you can consider, things like wind and solar, storage, hydrogen, even nuclear is, is, you know, doesn't produce carbon. And it's, uh, you know, uh, just to correct that misperception that you know, nuclear pr produces polluting activities, it doesn't. Uh, and these technologies can be considered in this, this scenario. And then people mix up this, this idea of this 100% renewables and net zero. And 100% percent renewables is very very different it's very very unique uh, but there's also a very small amount of technologies that can be can be considered uh, for 100 percent renewables and that's just you know renewables wind and solar storage and things like green hydrogen in terms of how do we plan for this future so we are currently you know we have this huge install base of lots and lots of infrastructure, whether it be transformers, substations, breakers, lines, uh, you know, power stations and so forth. We need to transition to where we need to be going. And, and, you know, really as a country, we've committed to net zero by 2050. So we need to move towards there. And that's the just energy transition plan for moving us from where we are now to our aspirations of net zero. But you have to balance all of that. And there's a lot of trade-offs. And, you know, in engineering, we always talk about trade-offs. There's a lot of trade-offs here, and it's, you know some of them are technical, some of them are you know non-technical and kind of uh, important parameters that you have to balance. Things like managing the, the economy, so you must have enough you know electrical energy to support the economy. Otherwise, you kind of struggle the, the economy. You have to manage that environmental imperatives. We need to make sure that the cheapest or the least cost technologies are chosen because ultimately you and I and you know every other citizen in South Africa actually pays for, for electricity when we use it. Uh, and we don't want to make that too expensive. We also need to make sure that you know whatever we use needs to come from our local resources. So it's our people, our manufacturing plant, and, and we support this entire industry. There's the cost to the end user. I've talk, talked a little bit about that, but we also need to make sure that we create jobs, right? Um, and, and that's really important that we don't import other skills from you know, elsewhere across our borders to help us with this stuff. We need to be creating uh, jobs. We need to train our uh, you know, technical people, engineers, technicians, apprentices to help support this industry. And we need to start doing a lot more of this local manufacturing. Where are we in terms of our price of electricity? And that's kind of a bar chart that I've got from Statistica. You'll see there's, there's places right at the top uh, that's quite expensive, almost uh, double or triple uh, the, the price of electricity that we pay, places like Germany, Denmark, and Belgium. Uh, we are kind of yeah, at the lower end of the, the, the spectrum, we South Africa, and you know our our cost of electricity is relatively cheap. Um, and it's important that as we start doing the trade-offs and balancing to move from where we are to kind of net zero, uh, we need to then um, talk about how does it impact the, the price of electricity. In terms of carbon dioxide, this is the world's contribution of to carbon dioxide. Uh, and you'll see, you know, big polluters in, you know, uh, in other continents like North America, uh, Asia, uh, Europe, you'll see Russia here, India here, uh, and all of the blue stuff is Africa. So everything that CO2 that's produced from Africa is everything in blue. We contribute to about 3% of the global emissions in the world. 
uh, South Africa is just about 50% of their total contributions to Africa. So it is carry, uh, currently worrisome, uh, and we need to do something of, uh, about that. Where does this emissions come from? Uh, and I've borrowed this from uh, the, the ministry's uh, report. You know, you'll see here a big chunk of, of uh, emissions is actually comes from, from the electrical sector. And then uh, some of it in transport and in a bunch of other industries. But, you know, if you want to start addressing the emissions, the carbon dioxide and all of the greenhouse gases, you know, it's important that we start here because that's kind of the biggest lever that we've got. In terms of our tariffing, um, the, the graph on the, on the left hand side is actually talking about North America and, you know, those various scenarios. And the graph on the right hand side is actually our country planning. It's called the Integrated Resource Plan. It's a very important plan. It talks about our next decade and what we're going to be doing in the next decade from electricity perspective. But you'll see, you know, as North America goes through various scenarios, things like net zero or carbon free or even 100% renewables, you'll see the price or the tariff of electricity increases. It doesn't increase dramatically for net zero, but it is going to be more costly. If you go to 100% renewables and, and so forth, uh, you'll see that the price of, of uh, electricity uh, actually goes up by two and a half times or 250%. Uh, it's massive, right? So it's a big imp important issue to understand the big difference between net zero carbon free and, and renewables. You'll see as we transition as South Africans, to kind of this net zero objective, uh, and this comes directly out of this integrated resource plan, you'll see our price does increase very similar to the rest of the world, in particular North America. This is the changes that's going to happen uh, from today, and you'll see we're predominantly coal-based, but we've got, you know, some PV, some wind, some nuclear, some hydro and, and storage. Uh, we've got about a 50 gigawatt system today. We need to transition that, and we are going to transition that uh, by the end of the decade by, you know, uh, to, to change that mix <coughs> to predominantly renewables, gas, nuclear, and coal. Coal will still remain, right? So we built Madupi, Kusile, and other power stations. They will still have a lifespan uh, at least over the next decade, if not longer. Importantly, you'll also find that our system grows. It grows from 50 gigawatt to 80 gigawatt. So to support our economy, to support you know the the manufacturing se sector, the mining sector, industrial sector, agricultural sector, you have to grow this uh, because we are a developing country. We're not kind of you know uh, a first world country where you know consumption is stagnant. Consumption is actually increasing. This is just another view of how things are going to change and you'll see coal will still be here. It'll start diminishing slowly by the end of the decade. And you'll see big changes in wind, solar, storage, hydro, uh, gas and diesel. Um, so that's, that's, that's what's coming. Importantly, as you go through this, this change, you have to look at what are these technologies out there and, and what can they do? Importantly, you'll see there's a bunch of technologies, some of which, you know, things like coal, nuclear, wind, uh, offshore and wind onshore, solar, uh, and all of its varieties and, you know, things like biomass and so forth are all part of the map. This I've got from the IEA uh, recent report. And the way you read this is that they, the upper bar talks about the, the upper level cost and the bottom bar talks about kind of the cheapest cost of a implementation of things like wind offshore. The, uh, the, the, the box in the middle just talks about your average price and, and the bar in the middle talks about global averages. So there's a bunch of these different types of technologies, each having their own cost profile, uh, but also importantly that, you know, certain technologies like wind and solar only produce you know, energy when the sun shines and when the wind blows. So it's, it's, you shouldn't only look at the cost, cost perspective. Interestingly, the graph below actually talks about different regions. So you'll see India here, the United States, China, Europe, Japan. And what you'll find is, for example, let's just take um, things like wind offshore, which is the, uh, the yellow bar. 
And you see the price of wind in China and the price of the same wind in the US and uh, the price of kind of wind offshore in Japan are, are totally different. And it's really important to appreciate that, you know, whatever is done elsewhere in the world is not the same circumstances back home here in South Africa. Uh, and those prices change regionally. This is what we need to meet, this kind of supply demand balance. And this I've got from the ESCOM system operator website. You guys can actually go there. Uh, it's, a, it's a public website and you can download this. And you'll see this is the variety of technologies that we de deploy on a weekly basis. So this is kind of Monday to, to Sunday. Uh, and you'll see the, the black stuff is, is coal. Uh, the yellow stuff is nuclear. There's the pink stuff, which is um, uh, CSP. There's red, that's PV. And you know, green is, is wind. Uh, sorry, the red is, um, is wind. And the, the, sorry, the blue is wind and the, the green is PV. And there's, there's a bunch of other technologies like gas and diesel that fills up kind of the, the gap. And this balance is met uh, in real time. Uh, and, and you deploy this, this variety of technologies to meet the supply. You'll see day on day, this, the shapes change and you'll see, you know, here, this is kind of when it's very hard to meet the supply demand balance. This is typically about four o'clock in the afternoon where this evening peak comes up. There's also a morning peak that, that you'll see here that's really about eight to nine o'clock in the morning. It becomes very hard because you can't deploy these technologies and they can't produce energy so quickly. In terms of the, the um, analysis, you know, you, there's a, a bunch of sensitivities. You know, if you use some, some of these technologies uh, too little, like you know, coal and nuclear, the price actually goes up. So the more you use the technology, the cheaper it becomes. But if you only deploy these technologies intermittently, the price goes up. Uh, this also talks about the sensitivity to, you know, your interest charges in terms of building out these new technologies. Um, and, you know, for, for lower interest rates, you know, things like nuclear becomes very, very um, cost competitive. This is a chart uh, uh, of renewable technologies, and there's some interesting points here. So this talks about a decade ago, 2010, and a decade thereafter in 2020 for things like biomass, geothermal, uh, you know, solar PV, CSP, uh, which is concentrated solar thermal, and the variety of wind technologies. You see technologies like biomass hasn't changed dramatically over the 10 years. Uh, geothermal thermal has actually gone a little bit more expensive, but you'll see solar PV, big, massive drop, big, massive drop for, for concentrated solar thermal and big, massive drop for wind. So, you know, these renewable technologies are becoming cheaper uh, and we must use them because, you know, in South Africa, we've been blessed with, you know, a lot of sunshine. In fact, our worst day of sunshine in South Africa is better than the best day in Germany. Uh, and that's how significant it is. There's other, uh, you know, technologies and other costs. It's not just, you know, the solar panel, it's the inverters, it's the storage, it's the commissioning and so forth. And you see the prices over the past uh, few years have been dropping steadily. Um, and that's really important to talk about this changing environment. There's changing environments with, uh, you know, uh, uh, different places. Uh, you'll see this is Africa and, and this talks to wind. Uh, there's, you know, Europe, and then there's uh, you know other places in the world, um, and and some of these these uh, these costs are highly sensitive to uh, the interest rate that you actually get to build or commission this, and these are the different interest rates. So you'll see how important that sensitivity analysis is to these interest rates. Gas is quite important, and you know you'll see as uh, things ramp up and down. I showed you at the morning and evening peak you see gas can actually, this is a comparison between coal and gas, and you see coal at the top uh, and gas at the bottom for hot start and cold starts. You'll see coal takes, you know, a couple of hours to respond, whereas gas takes, you know, in the region of two to five minutes from a hot start perspective to respond. Also, although gas does produce some, uh, you know, um, uh, CO2 and greenhouse gases, it doesn't produce too much compared to, to coal. So coal isn't green bar, 
gases in the red bar, and you see from a NOx, uh, nitrous oxides perspective, it's far less. From a SOx perspective, there's actually nothing. Uh, and from a carbon perspective, you see you have to actually unpack that bar and you see how significant coal is compared to gas. There's also, uh, you know, nuclear and nuclear will always be on, on the map and you'll see, uh, you know, this is the cumulative carbon dioxide that was avoided because of, uh, you know, the world investing in nuclear. We've got our nuclear plant here in Coburg and we also contribute to, you know, avoidance of carbon emissions because of nuclear. Then there's a whole bunch of implications for the transmission and distribution network. You know, your solar is predominantly here, your wind is predominantly on, on the west coast or southern coast, and you have to move this power to where it's being used, you know, predominantly in, you know, where, where, where you guys are in, in uh, KwaZulu-Natal, in Gauteng province, in Mpumalanga province. It means you have to build a lot of infrastructure to move the power from where it's being produced to where it's going to be consumed. And you have to think about very important things like making sure that you have enough generation for the 24 hour period called resource adequacy. You need to have enough transmission and distribution lines to do deal with delivery adequacy. You have to balance the supply and demand and the flexibility. Uh, and that's kind of, you know, when you don't get it very right, you, you get to things like load shedding and so forth. So you have to manage that actively. And then you have things like grid stability and, you know, uh, grid stability just talks to your residents on your network and your network does dynamically change. And if you start getting towards areas of your residents, you get to grid stability issues and you could actually, you know, stop supplying energy because you're getting into stability regions of the grid. What's coming on the, on the demand side is a lot of stuff. Things like electric vehicles is gonna have a humongous impact. Remember, you know, it's almost uh, similar to the, the consumption of, uh, of your household or about 50% consumption of your household. So, you know, the load starts increasing dramatically uh, when we start shifting over to electric vehicles. We see some of these things changing with lots and lots of PV and, and inverters and storage coming to the future. Uh, that also has an impact, right? So what happens if, if you have um, lots and lots of, uh, of solar and lots and lots of sunshine, you know, you don't have to produce this electricity on the grid. But if you have three or four days of rain, uh, you know, somehow something has to back it up. There's, you know, some of these very interesting applications like uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and so forth, that we're actually starting to, to apply right now in the research space, in the homes, in the you know uh, uh, manufacturing areas, industrial areas, commercial areas, and so forth. So very, very exciting uh, times. Dr. Zavin, sorry, man, could we, could we wrap up in a minute? Apologies. Oh, absolutely. So uh, I'm going to skip over this slide. I think very importantly, what we're seeing is the South African energy landscape, electrical energy landscape is changing uh, for a variety of reasons. And, and, and that brings new interesting challenges, new interesting um, you know, kind of research opportunities, new interesting skills that's actually required. There's a variety of different options of, from a generation technology. Each one of these generation technologies have this unique characteristics, you know, gas, can ramp up and down very quickly, but you know, um, it is quite expensive. But you know, things like solar and wind is very cheap only when they are available. Um, these prices are not uh, static and they're region dependent. There's big implications for transmission and distribution, build out infrastructure as this, this generation mix changes. Demand into the future is going to become so much more dynamic and leverage on things like artificial intelligence, machine learning, um, you know, smart sensors, IoT, fourth, fourth industrial re revolution. We're done doing a whole bunch of that, and we expect that to, to happen for, you know, at least more than a decade, a decade or two. Uh, and as this electrical in, uh, infrastructure becomes more and more cleaner, we can start doing far better things like, you know, cleaning up our transport sector and so forth. And there's a bunch of other, you know, international observations on, on future technologies, you know, things like green hydrogen, things like small modular reactors and so forth. We just have to be, you know, very keen and key, keep our eye on the pulse 
to make sure that we we kind of manage these technologies through uh, this this life cycle and you know start investing when when we get to uh, you know mature technologies and not be too uh, concerned about kind of the buzzwords in in, in that space. I'm going to stop it here, um, uh, Dr. Khan. And I'm going to turn it back to you. Thank you, Professor Mudli. Uh, I could uh, watch, I mean, listen to you go on on this topic for much longer than this, and perhaps we should have given you more time. So apologies. Uh, there have been requests for the recording for those who have joined late. It was very interesting. Um, and we, I'm sure guys are going to ask you questions afterwards, but we're going to have a slightly reduced Q&A session. So thank you, Prof. Awesome. Um, it gave, gives me great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, uh, Zanele, because we've worked together for many years here in KZN. Um, Zanele not only holds a BSc in electrical engineering from UKZN, but she also then went on to get an MBA from UKZN as well. She is currently employed as a senior engineer at ESCOM, uh, where she's working. She's been working for us for the last 14 years, and she's currently in our network engineering and design department. Zanele is going to now give you an account of her career. She, remember, has very recently been in your shoes, uh, kind of getting ready to go out into the world. So I think listening to her story is going to give you an insight as to what you can expect in industry, what to expect if you're going to be working for a company like ESCOM. So Zanele, with no further ado, can I hand over to you? Um, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Khan. <laughs> At least it's nice to call you a doctor now. Um, to the UKZN um, the Tech Talk uh, for granting me this opportunity. I am really honored uh, to share my journey and uh, I experience since graduating at UKZN. I will try my level best, you know, to be relatable to students um, as I was once um, as students um, many, many years ago. Okay, let me start uh, by greeting the leadership um, of the school, as staff, students, senior lecturers, um, ESCOM colleagues, uh, just in case I missed anyone out, uh, let me just say uh, all protocol observed. Uh, I'm just gonna uh, basically start by sharing my journey, a small background, um, on my university life uh, and then go straight to my experience uh, as an Eskomite. My journey with UKZN um, started back in 2002. Um, back then it was still called the University of Devon Westville and um, the University of Natal. Uh, I am one of the beneficiaries of science um, access a program which is called um, the Science Foundation. Uh, I started uh, my first year um, in electrical engineering, that was in 2003. And um, in 2004, 2005, we had a merger uh, of UDW and UND. Um, but I managed to complete my studies in 2000, 2007. Uh, out of all, you know, out of all my academic years in varsity, um, the one that always stands out is the year 2005 and six. You know, the year of the measure was the hardest. Uh, I'm sure some of you can relate. I mean, if you look at the pandemic um, that we've just had recently, you know, online studying, you know, it sort of disrupted a whole lot of things. Yeah, but for me, um, uh, yeah, the year of the measure was the hardest. Uh, we had a lot of, um, there were many casualties, you know, who dropped out um, to, you know, uh, some were excluded in that third and, and, and second year. Yeah, it was, it was tough. It was tough um, for all students, um, but obviously uh, with hard work um, and perseverance, I uh, managed to complete uh, my studies. I was an ESCOM BASA and um, I joined ESCOM um, in 2008 as um, an engineer in training. 
you know, when I joined ESCOM, um, the country, obviously, with ESCOM, we're in the brink of load shedding in terms of energy policy. ESCOM was vertically integrated, state-owned entity, which generated like 95% of South African um, electricity supply industry. And I mean, we had generation, transmission, and distribution, which is still the case, but not so much in terms of the generation capacity. I know um, we, we have seen what um, our Prof Modi has uh, projected. Um, yeah, there's, there's, yeah, we have new role players um, in the market. But around that time, we, you know, we had recession. However, there was still growth um, within our economy. And um, being an average student, you know, was still accepted. Uh, you know, um, after the measure, I was never really, I was never really an A student. I just wanted to complete my studies, go work. Um, but if you look at um, the current economy and the competition, I mean, um, average is no longer accepted. Average is no longer accepted to some of some sectors. They all require excellence. They require hardworking and engineers. Uh, competition is just too high. You know, um, I read uh, somewhere um, on the news, um, they basically stated that 60% of the grant beneficiaries that's like over half a million um, have tertiary qualifications. So you can just imagine the, the, the competition uh, that is out there, but it will require you as, as a student, you know, to excel. You just need to excel in your academics. Uh, someone said um, at university, you know, um, they teach you engineering, which is the application of mathematics, empirical evidence and science, economic, social, practical knowledge in order to invent, innovate, design, build, maintain, research and improve structures, machines, um, tools, systems, um, components, you know, fundamental, well, it, that, that is basically um, the, 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 the essence of what you are taught. It is the fundamental of your career. It channels you, it channels your thought process and you can never unlearn the basic principles of engineering. As I've mentioned before, um, I started my journey um, with ESCOM uh, in 2008. Um, trained for 18 months and I was also appointed um, as an engineer uh, in 2008. I have been, uh, you know, to various departments uh, responsible for the, you know, the, the, the expansion of, of, of um, ESCOM distribution grade in Guazulu Natal. Um, interestingly enough, um, ever since I, I started working at SCOM, I have been based um, in Guazulu Natal, just moving, you know, changing departments uh, within SCOM. Um, in 2014, I was promoted um, as a senior, you know, senior engineer. So over the course of, of my employment, I have um, acquired advanced knowledge on past systems planning, operations and events. I have um, investigated, researched, designed, implemented work on systems and processes to meet ESCOM's mandate of providing, you know, electricity in an efficient and sustainable manner. I have worked, you know, in urban areas. Um, I have also worked in remote and deep rural areas where there is no electricity and provided you know, electricity to grow the economy and improve the quality of life of the people of South Africa. Um, my journey uh, with ESCOM, I have been involved in many working groups, you know, task teams, investments, governance, committees, and which led me to, to sort of pursue 
and obtain my master's um, in business administration. I have seen the transformation, you know, within the energy sector in South Africa, you know, the restructuring um, of ESCOM and the new players entering the markets. Um, we have seen the, 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 the developments that were presented, um, I mean, by, by Pro Professor Mutli. Obviously, these are the challenging times and yet interesting times for engineers, you know, because we are building. Yes. Sorry, man. Uh, if I can ask you to wrap up soon, I just want to uh, do the Q&A quickly before the guys have to go for the elections. Sorry. Okay. All right. Um, but uh, just to um, let you know that, I mean, ESCOM is evolving. We, we are building smart grids uh, for the future. But just to give you some tips, you know, um, to you as students, because I was once in your shoes, uh, based on my experience and others on how to become a successful engineer. You know, these are some of the skills uh, that ESCOM and other recruiters are looking for. You will obviously, you have the, the background you are studying. Uh, 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 so you need to be up to date to your technical knowledge. You, you should have, you know, good communication skills, improve your skills. You know, project starts and end with human discussion. So you really need to work on your social skills. Uh, leadership, know who you are and add value to the organization, bring people together and influence. A, as an engineer, it requires for you, you know, to be a critical thinker, be analytical. You know, take advantage of your coworkers and ask questions. Remember that they may not have the degree that you are working hard on, but they're highly knowledgeable. Uh, you'll have to be like creative. Yes. <laughs> I, I, I feel so bad to stop you when you're speaking such truth, but uh, I hope the students are really listening to what you're saying because uh, I couldn't echo their sentiments any more strongly. Uh, thank you so much for this very heartfelt presentation. Uh, I'm sure that they really appreciated it and uh, you know we'll get that kind of feedback so thank you for taking the time and addressing thank the students i really appreciate it guys we are running out of time so we're not going to have too much of time for the q and a um i in Swaki, i thank you so much for answering a lot of the questions on the chat perhaps if you can maybe just uh tell the students and those present where can they apply for escom bursaries etc and you know when does it close Hi colleagues, we will be advertising our opportunities coming out. Um, so the first advert is, is anticipated to go out on the 1st of September, uh, but the adverts would be running between September and October, which is what happens every year. So they can go in and, and check out on them. I can also provide the students with a direct link of somebody that works with UKZN in our space. Who can where they can really just contact them and have a chat, you know, uh, outside of this program, and they should be able to, to then be able to be given uh, the information that they require through that um, 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 uh, contact. So I can I can send that in uh, after the session. Thank you so much, Antwaki. I think uh, you and I will keep in contact. I'm happy to assist from a technical point of view in the faculty, uh, and we can kind of engage that. Um, Prithavan, just maybe two questions for you quickly from the chat. Uh, Tandal Vetu was uh, curious about whether there are any future plans for nuclear power, and Mohammed Vauda was wanting to know why uh, ESCOM's not including tidal power in the energy mix. Okay, so rather quickly, uh, yes, in terms of the, the nuclear um, uh, nuclear energy opportunity, you'll see the country plan called IRP. Uh, does propose beyond the 2030 time frame that nuclear uh, would be a, a, an important consideration. Uh, so, you know, the, the Department of Minerals, Resources and Energy is a custodian for the plan, and you'll see, you know, things like nuclear and other, other variety of technologies are included. But remember also that it's a living plan. So as, you know, different types of technologies come to the fore, you know, some game changer technology, whether it's storage or you know, small scale nuclear, whatever the case may be, uh, every time that that uh, living document gets updated, 
to take into account these, these you know, technology changes, and sometimes it's disruptive technology changes. In terms of, of tidal, uh, tidal energy, uh, there has been some research that has happened throughout the world. Uh, most of the technology is still in the research phase. Uh, it, it uh, you know, it's kind of very much in its infancy. We do expect that, you know, as, as the, you know, all of the researchers and academics around the world puts more and more effort into that, we move that out of the research phase into a far more mature, mature technology. And as that mature technology starts to emerge, you'll see it gets onto countries' uh, planning processes like the IRP, Integrated Research Plan. But for now, it's, it's pretty much still in it. Thank you. Thank you, Pradhaman, uh, properly. Um, I think we now run out of time, so we're going to close the session. But before we do that, uh, I just want to remind everybody that there will be an upcoming Tech Talk, the next one in the series. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, it's going to be uh, hosted by Mr. Price. Perhaps somebody from the can share the screen. Uh, the invitations will be sent out uh, closer to time uh, with more details as to what's going to happen. Uh, guys, I'd like to close the session. Um, for those of you who are here and are going to attend my lecture, please don't be late. Um, but thank you so much to our ESCOM colleagues for taking the time to address the students today. Uh, the information were, I mean, the presentations were great. Uh, it was exactly what I kind of knew it was going to be. So uh, I wasn't disappointed. I'm sure none of the attendees were disappointed either. So again, thank you so much for attending. Thank you for all those who took the time to uh, attend this talk. I hope it was beneficial. If there's any information you need going further, uh, you could contact me with regards to that, I suppose, uh, and I can assist in whichever way I can. Uh, uh, Lena has mentioned that the recording will be made available as well. So with that, I'd like to close the session and thank you all.